Megger Wiley Evers was a civil rights activist and first NAACP field secretary in Mississippi until he was assassinated by Byron Della Beckwith, June 12, 1963. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemichistory.com. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon page in the description below. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. Megger Wiley Evers was born July 2nd, 1925 in Decatur, Mississippi. He was the third of five children to Jesse Wright and James Evers. He grew up in a farming family and James also worked in a sawmill. Evers would be drafted in the United States Army in 1943, where he served in the European theater and fought in France and Germany, as well as the Battle of Normandy in June 1944, before receiving an honorable discharge in 1946. Evers then enrolled in Alcorn College, now Alcorn State University, in 1948. He majored in business administration and competed on the debate team, football, track, sang in the choir with the junior class president before earning his bachelor's in arts in 1952. After school, he moved to Mount Bayou, Mississippi, where he initially found work as a salesman at the TRM Howard Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company. He soon became involved in the Regional Council for Negro Leadership, where he began to organize actions for civil rights. He got his first experience as a civil rights organizer when he spearheaded the Regional Council of Negro Leadership to boycott gasoline stations that denied black people the use of their restrooms. With his brother Charles, they all worked on behalf of the NAACP and organizing local affiliates. In 1954, following the Brown versus the Board of Education decision by the United States Supreme Court that desegregated public schools, Evers applied to the state-supported University of Mississippi Law School as part of a test case by the NAACP. Of course, his application was rejected because of his race. Thurgood Marshall served as his attorney for his legal challenge against racial discrimination. While he failed to gain admission to the law school, Evers managed to raise his local profile with the NAACP. So in November of 1954, he became the first field secretary of the NAACP in Mississippi. Then he would move his family to Jackson, Mississippi. As the state field secretary, Evers traveled throughout Mississippi extensively, recruiting new members for the NAACP, organizing voter registration drives, setting up new chapters of the NAACP, and he also led demonstrations and economic boycotts of white-owned companies that practiced discrimination against African Americans. Evers assisted in organizing the Biloxi Wade-In from 1959 to 1963, which protested against the city's public beaches on Mississippi's Gulf Coast. He also conducted action to integrate Jackson's privately owned bus companies and public parks, led a voter registration drive, and used boycotts to integrate Leake County schools, and he led very public investigations of the lynching of Emmett Till in Mississippi in 1955. While he was virtually unknown outside of Mississippi, he was one of Mississippi's most prominent civil rights activists. Evers' civil rights efforts, along with investigative work, made him a target for the very large population of white supremacists and the Ku Klux Klan. He and his family were subject to numerous threats and violent actions, and the weeks before his assassination, he encountered a new level of hostility. On May 28, 1963, a Molotov cocktail was thrown through his carport of his home, and on June 7th of 1963, Evers was nearly run down as he came out of the NAACP office in Jackson, Mississippi. Evers lived in the threat of constant death, and the risk was so high before his death that Evers and his wife trained his children on what to do in case of a shooting or a bombing or any other type of attack. Evers was almost regularly followed home by at least two FBI cars and one cop car, but early in the morning of June 12, 1963, he arrived home without an escort. There is some speculation that many members of the police force at the time were members of the Ku Klux Klan and were aware of the threat on his life. And Evers himself had been warned by his wife earlier in the week and he even felt that he was in greater danger than usual. After pulling up into his driveway and returning from a meeting with NAACP lawyers, he emerged from his car carrying NAACP t-shirts that read, Jim Crow must go. He was shot and struck in the back of the neck. The bullet passed through his heart and initially he was thrown to the ground by the impact. Evers rose and staggered about 30 feet before collapsing at his own front door. He was rushed to the University of Mississippi in Jackson where he's initially refused entry because of his race and was only admitted after his family explained who he was. He would pass away only an hour later he was only 37 years old. More nationally, he was buried June 19th in Arlington Cemetery, where he received full military honor.
honors before a crowd of nearly 3,000 people. The national outrage over Evers' murder only increased support for legislation that would become the Civil Rights Act 1964. After Everest was assassinated and estimated 5,000 people marched on a Masonic temple on Lynch Street and Collins Funeral Home to North Ferris Street in Jackson, Mississippi. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders led the procession and the local police came to meet the nonviolent protesters with riot gear and rifles. The mayor also made a public mandate against singing at the march, but the marchers sang songs of rage and sorrow anyway. With tensions extremely high, this led to a standoff between the marchers and the police, with the marchers attempting to maintain nonviolence. Early FBI investigations unearthed a suspect, Byron Della Beckworth, a fertilizer salesman, segregation, and a member of the Mississippi's White Citizens Council. An Edie Stone Enfield 1917 rifle was found near the crime scene, registered to Beckwith, and his fingerprints were found on the scope. Also, several witnesses placed him in the area around the time of the murder, and he was publicly swore to make every effort to get rid of integrationists. However, Beckwith denied shooting Evers and maintained that the gun had been stolen, and he produced several witnesses to testify that he was elsewhere on the morning of the murder. A bitter conflict over segregation surrounded the two trials to follow, with the White Citizen Council paying for Della with legal expenses, and he received support from some of Mississippi's most prominent citizens, including Governor of Mississippi Ross Barnett, who appeared with Beckwith at his first trial and shook hands with the defendant in full view of the jury. In 1964, two all-white juries, because at the time, black people were disenfranchised from voter registration practices, which meant they were also excluded from juries because the jurors were drawn from registered voters, both deadlocked on Della Beckwith's guilt and failed to reach a verdict, and he was set free after spending only 10 months in jail. After Beckwith's second trial, Myrtle Evers moved to Children of California, where she earned a degree at Pahoma College and later was named to the Los Angeles Commission for Public Works. She was convinced that her husband's killer had not been brought to justice and she never gave up the fight for his conviction and continued to press authorities to reopen the case. In 1989, the Jackson Clarendon Ledger published a report on its investigation with the Della Beckwith trials during the 1960s, and it found that the now defunct Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, a state agency supported by the residents' taxes and supporting the protection of the state image, assisted Della Beckwith's attorneys in the second trial. The commission used state resources to investigate members of the jury pool and aided the defense in picking a sympathetic jury. While a review of Hines County District Attorney's Office found no evidence of jury tampering, it did locate a number of new witnesses, including several individuals who could individually testify that Beckwith bragged to them about the murder. In December of 1990, Beckwith was again indicted on the murder of Megger Evers. Della Beckwith, now who lived in Walden, Tennessee, was extradited to Mississippi for trial at Hines County Courthouse in Jackson, Mississippi. Before his trial, the now 71-year-old asked the judge to dismiss the case on the grounds that it violated his rights to a speedy trial, due process, and protection from double jeopardy. The Mississippi Supreme Court ruled against the motion in a 3-4 vote, and the third trial began in January of 1994. Four. Ten months later, testimony began before a racially mixed jury of eight black people and four white people. During the third trial, the murder weapon was presented with Beckwith's fingerprints and with Beckwith claiming that the gun was stolen from his house. Beckwith now listed his health problems, his high blood pressure, his lack of energy, and his kidney problems, stating that I needed to recite a list from everything I suffer from and I hate to complain because I'm not the complaining type. An FBI informant, Delmar Dennis, testified that Della Beckwith boasted to him about his role in Mecker Evers' death at several Klan rallies and similar gatherings over the years following his mistrials in 1963. On February 5th, 1994, nearly 31 years after Mecker Evers' death, jury convicted Della Beckwith of first-degree murder for the assassination of Megger Evers and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Della Beckwith appealed against the guilty verdict, claiming that the 31-year-old lapse between the murder and Della Beckwith's conviction denied him a fair trial. However, the Mississippi Supreme Court upheld the conviction in 1997. 
Since the assassination of Medgar Evers, his contributions to the civil rights movement have been honored in multiple ways. He's been awarded the NAACP Spring Art Award in 1963. His wife created what is now known as the Medgar and Myrtle Evers Institute in Jackson, Mississippi, and continued the couple's commitment to social change. Early in 2017, President Barack Obama designated Medgar Evers' home a National Historic Landmark. Mississippi Senator Thad Cochran stated that the National Historic Landmark designation is the important step Step, recognizing and preserving significant civil rights sites in Mississippi and around the country.